Yeah, well, if I, I'm introducing myself to people who I knew and probably know me uh, from 40 years ago now when uh, uh, I was at Orders of Croydon. And uh, a wonderful store and great people working in it, which made it a great store. Um, firstly, I apologise for my appearance. I'm in the middle of a session of chemotherapy and my hair has all fallen out and I've lost weight and I look old and I'm falling asleep at the top of a hat. Uh, so I'm not at my best, but um, I'm just delighted. I admire you all for uh, uh, instigating this sort of get together um, uh, by some professional people that are gonna make it nice. Uh, good, good video on everything. So it's nice to, to see you all again and, uh, and talk to you a little bit about it. Um, I was the MD at Orders from 1978 to 1988. So my period spanned a 10 years uh, era. And it was an era. It was uh, in 1978, some of the extension had just been completed at uh, George Street um, and was opened with new escalators and a big hurrah, 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 uh, but it didn't actually, it wasn't actually doing that brilliantly at that time. And um, I was then the director of buying for orders from 1975 to 78. And uh, Peter Slaymaker, my boss, asked if I would move across to orders and of Croydon to try and help it through its opening and initiation uh, stages, which lasted 10 years. And I'm delighted to say, um, we did very well. All of you did very well. I started my career as a, as a management trainee at Harrods in London. Um, and that was in 1959. Um, and uh, I managed to scrape in one of the last of 65 applications uh, that were finally accepted for the tra management trainee courses. And I was there for two years. Um, Thoroughly enjoyed it, worked all the way through several departments at Harrods at the time, um, ranging from menswear, dress fabrics, soft furnishings and linens, carpets. So I had a good knowledge of all of those base areas of the business, which were so important in those days to department stores, um, long before shopping centres and heaven knows what. Um, and uh, my, my parents moved, my father got a promotion and we had to move into the Cambly area. Uh, he was based at Aldershot, home of the British Army. And um, I started at uh, Pages of Cambly as it was. I chose the uh, UDS group as it was in those days, as opposed to any other business. I could have gone and joined uh, the, the Debenhams crowd in those days, but uh, I chose uh, Alders, and uh, as it was, as it is now, Pages of Cambly, as it was. I've got an old photograph here of uh, Pages I can show you, uh, which is now Alders. And um, worked my way through there for about t 10 years, and started as a sort of trainee manager, helping all the departments, mainly soft furnishing and linens, and ended up as being the linen and buyer of the of the company for Cambly, and um, then Peter Slaymaker, a very young then managing director, took over the stores division, and uh, he asked me if I would go and join him, uh, helping him with the stores division. So there was a board of three of us, the main board of that of that era, uh, lasting from nineteen seventy five to about 1988 uh, when the board had magnified itself into 13 people from the three of us um, and uh, Orders of Croydon came up as would you please go and help at Orders of Croydon which I certainly enjoyed doing and took the store through a very interesting growth period um, when I joined the store I think it was doing something like 12 million pounds a year turnover and when I left the store in uh, 1988 we were doing a couple of million short of a hundred million turnover and um, that was due to a lot of clever buying, clever retailing, clever selling and a very good team of, of people, management and staff. Management and staff made the business. Um, 
Olders. What was Olders at the time? You were talking about Croydon. Yes. They have different yes. places. Yes, we, we well. had... Uh, you weren't judge only for Croydon. Uh, no, I was on the main board of all the stores. But uh, this Croydon was uh, the, the flagship store. And it, we used to say, you know, if, if Croydon sneezes, all the other stores go down with a cold. It was, uh, it was yeah. so... It was responsible for uh, a third of the third of the turnover of the business, but but well over fifty to sixty percent of the profit of the business. So it was a very very important store. We had at our peak we had twenty five stores um, all over the south of England mainly. We had stores in Newcastle um, and Cardiff, um, but our main source of, of Retail income was through the uh, south of England, southeast of England, um, and we gradually sold off a lot of the stores um, as business progressed and business changed. And it came out that uh, when I left in '88, I think we had about ten stores left, all very successful stores, all those of Sutton and Chatham, um, very very successful business, Arding and Hobbs, Clapham Junction. Very, very successful businesses. Um, but that, that, that's how big it was at its peak, 20, 23, 25 stores. But you came from Harrods. Was it not a downgrading going to all this? <laughs> Believe it or not, the, it, 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 it was in demographics of trading profile, definitely. It was, it was, it was but uh, it, it was also, I mean, Cambly in those days, there was actually a corral, uh, meaning a wooden stake, where the, the, the RMA based cadets for the military academy at Santos for our army were based and are still based there. And they used to tie their horses up outside in the high street before they would come into the store shopping. And it was just amazing. <laughs> you can imagine that in Knightsbridge. <laughs> It was crazy, uh, but that's what it was like. Um, but no, the, it, it was a. It was a. You could tell it was a, a company that was going places in the UDS group. Uh, I was young. I was ambitious. Um, it was a young. It was an old store, it, it, with some mature staff that probably needed a bit of help, and uh, we we sort of managed to to get it buzzing, and had a couple of very large departments that were actually the biggest in. One of them was the biggest in, in England at the time, and uh, even a small provincial store in Cambly, as it was then. It's not now, but as it was then. Um, so yes, it was a bit, but uh, it, was, it was also a store where you could see it was going to go in places. And they were a very f forthright family. Uh, the UDS group was owned mainly by the Lyons family, and uh, the, head of the, the head of us, uh, the business, was uh, Bernard Lyons. Um, uh, great, great man. I, I loved working with him. Super man. And uh, he and his brought his son into the business, who eventually became the chairman of, of Alders Department Stores, Robert Lyons. Uh, I still speak to and still see frequently. And um, it was still a family business until they were uh, taken over uh, uh, and had an opportunity to sell the business. They didn't want to sell it at the time. I think it was a bit of a hostile bid, but it was uh, run and accepted, and uh, we became uh, part of the uh, Hanson Company, which was also a big experience in management, business management for all of us, all of the board. Um, and they were, I, I felt, I enjoyed working with the Hanson Company. They were no, no cards hidden up the sleeve, Tell it as it is, get it done, please. Um, don't moan about it, you know, sort your problems out, that's what you're paid for. Get on with management and manage the business. And uh, that, that philosophy, for my mind, was it was a philosophy I enjoyed working under at the time. But yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a downgrade in, in uh, probable demographics of customer trading. <laughs> yes. To answer your question. What was the role, uh, uh, of course you were the managing director, what was the role of the managing director and what was your role? What, 
did you do? Okay. Uh, yes. Well, we, we didn't. Uh, I was actually the store director. Uh, we, we didn't have managing directors running our stores. We had store directors. But I happened to be the store director who sat on the board representing the other store directors of all the other stores to the main board. Um, and uh, I was, it was called divisional board director. There would, we would be sitting with alongside the people who worked for Ever Ready Batteries and some Frankfurter company that Hanson had bought in those days. The London Brick Company was Hanson and that was in the Hanson era. And we kept that structure. So uh, my interface would have been with the divisional board of which I was a member. Um, and uh, my main contact would have been the chairman, Robert Lyons, and the uh, MD of the division, which was Peter Slaymaker. And it was very good. You know, we all worked together. We all had the main objectives of making a successful business out of it, uh, which we all did. And um, it was it was it was a good relationship. I still speak to Peter Slaymaker probably once a month. And Robert Lyons has just sent me a copy of his latest book that he's written. Um, and so it was it was it was a very professional relationship when it needed to be, but a, a very friendly relationship when it was also appropriate. So it was a good relationship. And normally it, they would listen to what I had to say about what I wanted to do with Croydon as opposed to them influence what was happening in Croydon. And we, we sort of led our own life there as a, as a subdivision of the department stores division. So it was, it was, it was amicable. Um, not to the extent that there were any favouritism for me. So when it came to the annual review of the capital expenditure, my, my hand would be up to try and get the money for orders of Croydon that needed this and needed that and needed something else. But uh, I would be competing with my co-partners in other stores who also had some important things that they wanted to get done to their stores. Um, so it was, yeah, I had to work hard for it, but enjoyed it. Loved it. What was Alders in Croydon at that time? Uh, Alders was. Describe a bit. Uh, Alders was Croydon at that time. Um, I'm delighted to say. Um, I'm proud to say. Um, we had competition with a private store called Grants, uh, which I believe is still privately owned. And we had the Debenhams opposite us. And when I took over in 1978, we were probably the second biggest store in Croydon at that stage. Uh, Debenhams were taking, taking more money than us. And within a couple of years, we'd buried that competition and buried Grant's competition and gone on to be very successful as Croydon's leading department store. And for the record, at the end of the period in 1988, Alders of Croydon was considered to be the third largest store in the United Kingdom. It was only Selfridges and Harrods who were bigger than us uh, in size and turnover. So we we climbed the ladder immensely. But it was a very important trading position in Croydon, the High Street. Um, and it, it was adjacent to the Whitgift Centre, which was, uh, I think, the, the first ever open shopping centre in, in England, the Whitgift Centre in those days. And we sat through the refurbishment of the, the Whitgift Centre with its new roof, which was, which was wonderfully done. And um, they had access to the High Street, to George Street, and uh, the, the main, obviously, centre of the Whitgift. So that, that was the core of the uh, trading was the Whitgift Centre in those days. I don't know what that is now with uh, the development of Purley Way, with all the uh, operations in Purley Way that are trading there now. Um, you know, sadly, the cake doesn't get any bigger, but with more people trying to get their slice of it, it gets harder. And that was apparent when all of a sudden you could drop your car off at a, par at a car park directly opposite where you were shopping like you could in Pearly Way and still can in Pearly Way 
and that was free and it was always a bit of a battle with Croydon Council about uh, increasing the car parking charges in the centre of town and we fought like hell to, in, to, to prevent that being increased every year um, and um, sadly I think now it's a very important revenue stream for them and therefore they, they have to provide good parking facilities which are very expensive but you know in in those days we objected to the large parking fees and we, we used to in fact Croydon Council were very good I used to meet with the retailers and we'd all discuss how much they think they could increase it this year was it 10p an hour or 8p an hour or whatever it was in those days that's ridiculous by the way um, but you know, the, the car parking is a fees are a great deterrent for people to, to shop in, in the middle of the old town centres. It's one of the problems the town centres have got. Um, where do you park? How much do you charge for parking? Uh, so there's a bit of a challenge for them. But you know, Croydon, the orders of Croydon was uh, the main draw uh, for people, I think, to come in to shop in Croydon. Um, in fact, at Christmas we used to put in our animated Christmas windows where we'd had moving figures that were doing things like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs or Cinderella or whatever it was. And you'd actually find people driving in at night, parking up and taking their children to look at those moving uh, animals and uh, moving creatures as a, a, a good Christmas treat. Then they'd go and have a bite to eat somewhere in town. And it, it, uh, it was... Uh, it was a jolly good time was had by all. But that's how popular we were in those days. People would drive in out of hours and want to just look at the windows, see the figures working. So it was, it was, it was a great draw, great draw. So you have uh, all those in the centre and uh, maybe describe a little bit the city centre of Croydon. Yeah, the city centre of Croydon, yeah. That, um, well, they, there's done a lot of pedestrianisation. Council have done well planning it uh, initially. It's just that it's just sp spiralled into two divisions now. There's the sort of pearly way division of the shopping, um, and then there's the town centre division of the shopping. The town centre, because of retailing generally, uh, is, is not as interesting now as it ever was. We used to make it interesting to shop there, all the different shops, and we get celebrities in and. You know, we'd have Father Christmas arriving on a camel. Uh, that was one of my stores. I had Father Christmas arriving on a camel. Never do that again. And <laughs> oh, we'd, we'd have him arriving on a, you know, a, a horse, and it was it was a great attraction. And I think uh, a lot of that's uh, lost, sadly. Um, the tram link caused a lot of chaos. The building of the cat trains and that tra tram link. Um, all the, all the retailers suffered when that was built um, in the seven, late 70s, I think, early 80s. Um, necessary uh, um, nowadays, but uh, uh, amazingly, the clock's gone right back, hasn't it? Um, but it, well, it is um, it, it's still a good shopping centre, but in the old days there was the High Street, which was the, one of the main attractions. The Whitgift Centre was a, a main attraction. And right banging in the middle of the middle of Wickham Centre was always a Croydon. So we had access to all the main road, all the main areas uh, for the public, and we had great public access into the store through uh, our uh, little shopping mall that we built. And that was that was brilliantly designed by us internally at the store um, to link George Street with um, the High Street. And that, that is lovely. Have you shopped in it? It's lovely. Great, we in three branches. One branch is food, uh, the other branch is services, and the last branch is menswear. And uh, if you, they, they, they all meet in the middle of the store, and then you've got your store facility of perfumery and jewellery and all the stuff that the ladies like. So, uh, very good. But uh, in those days, uh, Croydon, the population was about the same, but the uh, the op the opportunity of retaining aspect was a bit limited whereas we came in with a huge department store great selection of everything because we had the space and we could sort of commandeer that uh, 
that uh, position as number one retailer in the town, which uh, uh, I, I don't know what was, what, what's happened now, but that was how it, it was. And could you explain a bit about the departments which you had? Yes, to yeah, sure thing. There, there was um, we had uh, we were we was we specialist in household merchandise, uh, carpets, linens in those days, soft furnishings. Um, curtains, um, lighting. We had the biggest lighting de department in the south of England. We had the largest ready-made curtain department in Europe. Um, we had the biggest so linen department in uh, the UK at one stage, uh, in England I should say, not the UK. Um, and we were famous for our household goods. Um, we were, if anything, a little bit weaker on the fashion side, um, but we brought in a lot of concession business to help us lift that up to a better standard. Some of the uh, shops like Jaeger um, and, um, helped us to establish ourselves as a, a recognised fashion outlet as well as just the best place to go if you wanted to buy a decent lampshade at a good price or a decent carpet at a good price or a half-price three-piece suite. And of course that was picked up by the pearly way traders. They're now got their shops and that doing that sort of business and doing it very well and very successfully. Um, people like Furniture Village, uh, uh, run by my old friend and Alders colleague Peter Harrison. Uh, who I not run by, he owns it, and um, you know, they've, they've got a tremendous business now down the, down in the Purley Way. So, but in those days, uh, we we tried to we specialised on the household merchandise, and we probably needed to upgrade ourselves a bit on the fa on the female fashion side. Menswear was okay. We had all the fancy Italian suit companies in there, and. Jaeger and everything like that, but it was just the ladies' fashion that we were a little bit weak on. But we built it up gradually. Good, good staff, good management at Croydon in particular, and we managed to build it up uh, eventually to a credible size. But it was, uh, it was, it was a bit tough. It's very hard to persuade somebody coming in buying a carpet that there's a fashion department upstairs. Don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Take the escalator, madam, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, can you you just explain some of the uh, where you bought, which companies you bought from? Can you explain a little bit uh, how how it was in the early sixties? Uh, sorry, late sixties, early seventies. Where, wow. where did you buy from? Well, yeah, in, in nowadays when you go to a right, when I was American, a, uh, American shops like Target, everything is Chinese. Great, great, great question. Uh, in those days, I remember when I was a linen buyer, buying for the linen department at, at Pages of Camberley in 1970, no, 1963, 64. Um, we used to go direct to the mill and Manchester was a huge uh, industrial city in those days. It's so sad to you know, accept that that's gone to what it's gone to now. All the, the old mills that, that I used to visit are now sort of offices and, and that. But you used to go direct to the mill and uh, you know, you got, you got your sale merchandise there from them um, and you bought your merchandise direct from the tower manufacturer and from the, the manufacturer of the sheets and linens and everything else. A lot of the fabrics in that in uh, the country came from Uxbridge, from Sanderson's Fabrics, who had a site of 100 acres in, in Uxbridge. Can you believe that now? What well, that must be worth, God. Um, and you'd go there to buy your soft furnishings. Um, and you'd get a good relationship going with your, your, your supplier um, and uh, anything that you wanted you would have huge pattern books to show people what it could be like. You didn't always carry the stock because you couldn't afford to carry all the stock but uh, unlike the uh, uh, linens uh, you, you would buy the sheets, buy the towels 
and just take pot luck that you bought the right colours and the right sizes and everything else. Um, there was things where you, if you had a good arrangement with your manufacturer, he would let you take some stock and if you didn't sell it, you could return it. That was called SOR, sale or return. So you didn't actually have to mark that stock down to sell it yourself. He would take some of that hit for you and you could debit him back the cost price of what you paid him to buy the stock in the first place. Um, and then you gradually saw uh, the, the, the market change from um, all of a sudden Italy came in making fabrics. Uh, and you couldn't believe that, that, that actually Italy was making beautiful curtain damasks and velvets and things like that that we've not seen in England. And all of a sudden the soft furnishing business changed. Um, and you, you gave way to some of the more exotic merchandise that was available. Conversely, uh, India started manufacturing sheets and, and towels and things like that. And of course they were cheaper than we could manufacture in England. Um, and then the government tried to do deals with the British manufacturers to subsidise them in some way, but it never worked. The, they came straight in and all of a sudden from selling no towels, and it was good quality merchandise. We were India, the Indian towels were selling 20% uh, cheaper than the British stuff. And that's what people wanted, you know, a towel's a towel. You use it to get dry. And if you can save money, you'd like to save money, especially if the quality's there. So there was lots of change in that respect. Some of the English manufacturers woke up to that and said, look, we realize you can't stock all the products all the time. Um, can we open a little section in your shop and can we call it a sort of concession and you know, can we put our girl in to sell it as opposed to rely on your girls selling it or your men selling it? And he said, oh, well, then they'll have a vested interest, i.e. a commission, to, to pay for the stock that was coming in from us into our shop and all you'd have to do is just take a percentage of the sales um, of or, or the net profit of the sale after we deducted the cost of the staff. And you opened up, started opening up concessions. And there was also a lot of the British manufacturers at the time, a lot of the, the guys with ambition decided that they would try and put their own name to manufacturing what was being manufactured by a major company, but not doing it very well. And they would pick that up. Uh, an example of that is another dear friend of mine, Derek Croson, who left a huge company called Moigashar to open his Croson Fabrics. And in the end, he was the, he supplies about 75% of all he did, all the, manu all the fabrics that are used in British upholstery and curtains are ready made. They're all his fabrics now. And he made, uh, he opened up a big manufacturing plant down in Sussex and he imports now from, from Italy uh, and, and all over the world. So there was life before China. Uh, now, I don't know, I'm too old to know what the latest situation is. I gather, you know, there is no life without China. Uh, what I can gather from people, um, uh, you know, most of the three-piece suites and the furniture is coming from China now. Everything comes, seems to come from China. Uh, their electrical goods can be a little bit suspect at times, but basically it, it's a decent product. Um, probably we're sitting on a chair that was made in China, I don't know. But uh, it was pre-China and it was a very exciting period. You watch people break away, start something, put a name to something. Uh, another very popular guy was the guy from, who opened up George of, of with that, that um, not Astor Sainsbury's I think. And he was, a, he was in charge of a big company and he split away and opened up his own little company specializing in, in all the best sellers of the big company, but doing it better. And all of a sudden he had a huge business on his hands. Um, so a lot of the names that, that are um, around now were originally uh, from 
major companies that decided to have a go by themselves and not rely on the the parent company <coughs> for whatever reason. So it's changed changed greatly. Uh, what the future holds, I oh dear, <laughs> I wouldn't like to say, but uh, yes, it's uh, it, you know I mean all of a sudden you get a bottleneck in the Suez Canal or something, and you can't get any stock from China. Uh, I'm told that you know sometimes you you you, tell, you say in the retail shop we can deliver that in six weeks, and in actual fact it can take up to four months because there's something blocking it or there's some query or. Remember the, the the ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal for a period of time, and nothing will get through. And of course, then all your stuff is waiting on order for customers. You keep having to apologise. You haven't got it in stock. Of course, these days the manufacturer, the retailers do not hold the sort of stock that we used to hold. We'd actually sell a three-piece suite, and it would be in stock. Or we would sell curtains that you could see in the in the store and take home with you and hang. Um, but um, that, that year has changed slightly, but uh, uh, I must be honest, it was, uh, it was good fun. <laughs> what about the customers? Yeah, uh, the, yeah. What kind of customers you were aiming at? You know, coming from Harrods, for instance, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, that, well it was, it was um, yeah, we, we, it, this had to be a, a unified agreement with the buying teams as to what, what merchandise we would be stocking. It is based on demographics mainly, um, of, of even population um, and, and ethnicity of population. We have a store in Clapham Junction, uh, Ardings, and they would like bright colours and busy colours and this, that and the other because of their population of that area. Our people, uh, I wouldn't say we were the Pearl and Twinset Brigade, um, but our people enjoyed Jaeger and uh, all of that because it was classic women's material and classic women's fashion and chiffon and, and uh, expensive fabrics, um, dupe, dupions and that sort of thing as opposed to prints. So it, it, you had to work with your buying team, which was easier to, to do if you had the buyer on the premises, but a little bit harder when you're dealing with a buyer who one minute is looking to buy merchandise for Clap Junction, the next minute is looking to buy merchandise for, for Croydon. Um, and we had a demographic, good demographic of sort of BCDs, um, we had a few A's, not many D's, F's, or H's, or if they won't go that low, which they don't. Um, not that we, we, we didn't want that business, we wanted any business. Um, and a lot of our business was aspiration. The people in the lower demographic system wanted to have the merchandise that was available, not necessarily with the ready cash available, and then you brought in your own finance pl plan for them where they could afford it on a form of higher purchase, or we didn't used to call it that, but it, that's what it was. Um, so we covered most demographics, but most, most people aspire to trade up with their thoughts of what they wanted uh, eventually. You know, we, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't sell a plastic three-piece suite, you'd try and sell a leather three-piece suite. A lot of difference. Um, whereas the plastic would be half the price of the leather, um, people would probably in our area want to have leather as opposed to plastic. So you had to dream up a new word for plastic and try and sell it, <laughs> which people did. <laughs> or you just say, oh, it's leather, that's plastic. You'd, Madam, take, take your pick. And uh, the customer would make the final decision. But uh, yes, it, 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 was, it, was, it, it was hard. It was, it, was, it was difficult to get a balance to how much of your cash you had in your stock compared to the total retail value sales that you would get out of that stock and that's where you dependent on your your selling staff on the shop floor and uh, I had some unbelievably good staff working in in Croydon unbelievably good staff that were the best selling staff you could imagine in fact that some of the modern staff that you see working in retail now 
you who wouldn't have employed them? But we wouldn't have employed them in those days. It's a hard thing to say, but I can say it. At 83 years old, I can say, we wouldn't have given them a job. Um, uh, and uh, they, they were, we had great people, and they could always try and sell up. They had the, the, the desire to see somebody leave the store looking lovely, looking great, as opposed to, well, I bought that one because it was a bit cheaper, and I think I look good in it, don't you? And somebody holding the back of the shirt going, oh, yes, yes, you look fine, you know. Or pulling the knees up to say, yes, no, it doesn't need shortening. Well, it did, and we had workrooms that would do that at the time. You know, a girl would go down to the, a member of staff would go down to the department, and the customer would be looking at a beautiful silk dress for, in those days, say, 50, 60, 70 pounds. Uh, I'm going back 30 odd years. And um, if the hem needed to come up a, a, a half an inch or an inch, we would send our dressmaker down there and she'd look at it. She had a workroom staff of X number of girls. I think we had about four or five working in the workrooms on the premises at, at Orders of Croydon to, to, to do it properly. And um, uh, it would be done properly to suit the customer. And that also is sort of missing today in um, non-viable, isn't it? It's just sort of, you don't see it anymore. Very lucky if you can get the shop assistant to get you the right price on the ticket into the till. And um, yeah, it's very sad. It's all down to training. We had a great training department at, at Croydon. Very good. We, we introduced, um, or, or I, I helped introduce the um, the training scheme, management training scheme, um, that basically I was on at, 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 at um, Harrods in the old days, and we sort of glorified it to suit, in those days, 20 years later, the, the, the need. And uh, we had some great staff. There, there were two contenders. Uh, contenders. Uh, one was the uh, postgraduate opportunity, from the people leaving university, and the other was whereby, which we're proud of, the people in the department, each manager would recommend somebody who he or she thought was a very exceptional person. And rather than let that person go and go and join another company, we would manage to get him or her onto our scheme where they could see a future of going on to become a departmental manager and we had, or even a store director, we were two or three of our people at Croydon went on to become store directors, which is the final accolade for them. And we're very proud of that. That was a very successful uh, venture. We had about 18 uh, on, the, on running as the permanent team, and they all gradually progressed into the business, mingled into the business, picked up roles within the business, and then went on to run other companies. Uh, out of the companies within the orders group, by the way, uh, so we were proud of that. But uh, yes, it was, it was, it was very, di very, very difficult to adjust to making sure that our customers aspire to what we were selling, and uh, indeed we had the ability to to prove that we had the capability of providing that service. Service was very important in those days, very important. I mean, it couldn't be happen there. It couldn't happen now. But I mean, at, uh, uh, at Harrods, you would deliver uh, a pair of stockings free uh, if a customer bought them in the hosiery department. You deliver them, and you deliver them by one of their little electric vehicles that they had running around in those days that went on charge every night because they only had a limitation of about a hundred miles round, running around the West End of London delivering this. And, uh, and so often or not, they used to break down. And as, as a trainee, management trainee, you had to go on a, uh, a, a late night every month to be around to go and help push or take a battery to the old vehicle that stuck in K Kensington High Street because the driver ran out of power. I mean, it's a bit talk about electric vehicles, you know. It, um, and he'd broken down in the middle of Kensington High Street doing a delivery because he'd been driving it too long and uh, you'd have to run out there with it in a, another electric vehicle and take the bat a spare battery and charge it up and then drive the original one back and that was part of your duty as a trainee which uh, 
didn't take long before you were saying to the drivers, don't run out of battery, you know, we can't keep sending guys out at nine at night to pick it up. Anyway, we, we got there in the end, got there in the end. So what was the service standards at all those? We, were, we, we, we aspired to be at the best possible standard you could possibly be. We did a lot of staff training. Um, anybody joining the company knew would, would be subjected to a staff training program. Um, and it was some, sometimes it was hard to get rid of the old ways of doing things with people. You know, we, we tried to let all the staff know that we appreciated our customers. You know, we valued our customers. We valued our custom. Um, and uh, so there was detailed staff training every week. We would um, take a half an hour out of our week to do staff training by the departments and concerned, not necessarily by us as management. You know, if there was a problem with something in the jewellery department, they could cover that in their own training department session. Um, it wouldn't be down to us, it would be down to them to, to decide what they wanted to talk to the, the staff about. Um, once a month we would put in a sort of financial situation like, well, all the other departments are trading at about eight or nine percent increase on last year. You're, we are under that. You know, we, we we'd like you to try and pick up on the fact that can we get the second sale out of people? Can we get a slightly higher average sale out of customers? And all of those sort of things that make good management and a good business. You know, um, so it, we 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 set ourselves some very high standards, and we're very critical of each other if, if for any reason they didn't materialise. Uh, we used to get customer complaints, of course we did. We had a customer service bureau whereby um, you could go and make your complaint there and then if you needed to or if you wanted to say thank you to, to about a member of staff we would lock it on our book and um, let the non member of staff know that we'd, we'd had a compliment about them and well done. So we tried to encourage people to be part of the business and I think that that was really why the business was so successful. It, was, uh, it wasn't down to any senior, well the senior management contribution was, was great. I had some great people working with me um, for, for the benefit of this video. Uh, Jeff Eaches was one of the co-directors. He passed away about um, six, six months ago in Spain. He moved to Spain. He li we lived about 10 minutes, 20 minutes by car away from him. We'd meet up, meet up most Sundays for lunch and chew their fat about the old times. And he passed away recently. But th that sort of staff training was done by the senior directors and also by the departmental managers. But it, and it also picked up if we got any complaints that were beginning to um, be too prevalent with, with people's comments. Uh, you promised you'd be here between 10 and 2 and you turned up at 4 and you know you then realise the importance of yeah you know somebody that's just not right you know you, you can't keep people waiting in all day to get something P probably a good reason when you spoke to the dis the dispatch guys or the, the transport guys well you know there was the breakdown on the Fl Croydon flyover we were in the middle of that we stood there waiting there for an hour to, and you could understand that but the customer didn't get his or her goods, and that was what our object object was. And you can't you can't get away with that hit and miss attitude if you're trying to handle A, B, and C demographics. You know you can you can't they won't be pushed off with whether well, there was a breakdown on the cord and flyover. You know, you know it's, 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 yeah, what happened to the ambulances that day? Everybody dying, and you 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 you, you couldn't you couldn't get away with that. It, uh, we very, very much cared about our customer relations, very, very much, yeah, very important. Good training, great training department we had, and uh, uh, it was, the customer was king. Sadly missing, I think, these days. We did everything we could to make our staff happy. We had a, a subsidy on the staff food that was served in the canteens, or the canteen. Um, 
um, which which cost us a lot of money to, to, to keep that subsidy going. Uh, we tried, we, we opened more hours, uh, which you, again, you, you know, was management decision. We had, we had to improve our business. Once all the people opened in the Purley Way, uh, they were trading from nine o'clock at the morning till nine at night. And we were a high street store, and, you know, so we had to keep open till nine at night. That's when I introduced late night trading to, you know, and, and it was, and even, um, they were open seven days a week. Well, we, we couldn't open seven days a week. The, the council wouldn't let us, absolutely right. But it was no good being in the town centre if, if the people in the suburbs are able to go, go into a shop in the mall, in, in, the, in, in, a, in a main road, and get served on a Sunday. And you know, Sunday they're gonna spend thousand pound, two thousand pound on a on a settee or a three piece suite. Um, you know, the husband wanted to be involved. He didn't want her the wife going out and blowing that sort of money without him seeing it. And so we started opening on bank holidays, which was very unpopular. Um I'm, I'm put, and, and and over at Easter, which was also very unpopular. I had a, a lot of uh, uh, discussions with the uh, uh religious people of the town at the time. It's still a town, Croydon, isn't it? Not a city. Um, yes, it was It was very difficult, you know, what are we doing? And a bit blasphemous to open on a Easter Sunday and you say, well, people want to, want to buy, they want to shop, they, you know, we were just providing a service. Um, it was like the first time we opened late on a Thursday till eight o'clock at night, there were lots of people Lots of people used to come in on that. I couldn't believe it. The first, 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 we, we did that. We were surprised how busy we were. And we had to schedule our staff on rotor systems to make sure that there was a decent understanding that if they came work late night, they'd get a, an early, more, a later morning start. And a lot of the, a lot of the ladies with families loved that. You know, I didn't mind working till nine o'clock one night, if the next morning they could get in at lunchtime, they had a whole morning then to do this and that and whatever they wanted to do. So although the evening, three hours might have been lost in the evening, they gained five hours during the daytime. Um, so it was it was all very unbelievable at the time to go through that pros processes um, of trying to persuade everybody to realise um, we uh, this is the problem that is with the NHS at the moment, that that we live in a seven day week, a seven day a week, week world, not a five day a week world, you know, and um, that's why you know the problem is with the doctors and the consultants. You very rarely see them in the hospital on a Saturday in the, or a Sunday, um, and it, 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 it's still a problem that's that's there, with with. Some retailers still couldn't believe it. I went somewhere the other way, I won't say where, and they still close on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> you think, God, I stopped that 50 years ago. You know. Close on a Wednesday afternoon, you know. one o'clock. Sorry about it, we're close now. Yeah. Oh. But it's one o'clock on a Wednesday. I oh, know, we close Wednesday afternoon, sorry. And, you know, that, that era has got to pass. But. Uh, it's still very exciting. It's still very exciting, especially with the uh, with the mail order and the uh, the internet now for for purchasing. Retailing is is struggling, struggling immensely. Just coming back to the uh, members of staff. Yes. You said you treat them well. What what happened? You mentioned briefly the the social club and all the things. Yes, we were very. I think we were very lucky. We we had a a guy called Terry Viviash. And he was a great guy, I tell you. He, he, he was a drummer on a dance band that played on an ocean liner when I first met him, years and years and years ago. And um, he was he was very he had a brilliant mind, and he used to speak up for the staff at the meetings. And I thought, well, you know, we've got to use that for the benefit of the company. No good. That, that individual, so I made Terry the chairman of our sports and social club. And we opened a sports and social club, which was unheard of, and agreed, in fairness, by the board. Um, 
and we uh, opened a bar for the staff where they could go every evening if they wanted to and we put on different functions for them and we had to let them buy their, their drink there at, uh, at trade prices. We made no profit out of the, out of the bar, it was subsidised. And Terry was in charge of our staff council. We brought a, uh, in a policy of staff council where different people were elected every year by uh, uh, the, the head of each floor or each senior person of that floor. And that's how we split our management. Um, to represent the staff on the floor. And uh, as somebody said to me once, the, the, the main problem to start with is always the chips are cold and the toilet paper's too thin. <laughs> Once you get past that, <laughs> which, is, which was so true, <laughs> we changed the toilet paper. And we started serving hot chips in the restaurant, in the staff restaurant, instead of cold chips. But, you know, everybody said, well, that's all they do, is just talk about, moan about this, and moan about that. But they didn't. They were very constructive. Our staff council was very constructive. Um, helped us with, you know, do you do realise by doing this, this might happen? Or, well, I don't think that's going to go down very well with so-and-so. And they would help you solve your management problems if, if we had overlooked anything um, and we, we, were, we weren't perfect so there were things we probably overlooked but uh, the, you know, the, the um, allowance for time off and um, the problems with trading later at night and how you, how you then uh, allocate all your staff, very very difficult to do. I had 1300 staff there so you know it's not a matter of just waving a wand and saying we're going to by the way, we're opening now till nine o'clock on a Thursday. Oh, thanks very much, boss. Yeah, great. You know, and you're going to come and tell my old man. Um, and it, so, those things need a lot of careful thought and structure as to how you're going to pay them, um, availability. Um, some of the younger people would would uh, delighted it because if we had to pay overtime, they would earn a bit more money. But if you paid too much overtime, you weren't making any money. So it wasn't worth doing in the first place. <laughs> so it's, it's all a matter of balance and discussion. But uh, Terry did a great job for us running the staff council. And we all, he organised, we had two football teams, two netball teams, two netball team girl netball teams representing Alders of Croy in their Sunday leagues. And we had two football teams um, from the boys and they, they wanted their own football team and so you know we had to buy all the kit for the for the for the for the football teams and, and again that that was that was important and we used to have an evening when the if the girls did well with the netball we would and the boys did well with the football season we would have a sort of celebrity evening where we we put on a little disco and you know put some free booze up and uh, and get a bit of a celebrity in to do a presentation or whatever. Uh, so the staff relationships were very important, and we were we were very lucky. We had some good people. Terry helped with the uh, the socialising of those people. So a lot of them met together. He he would put on a little menu in in the staff canteen staff area, which was the canteen area and the leisure area uh, in the evenings where. He would take over the sale of pies and things that the, some of the staff would want to take if they were going to stay, say they live by themselves or living a uh, young person in a flat and, you know, didn't want to go home and put something in the microwave. He could have a pie and chips at the, in the staff canteen at a subsidised price. And um, so it was, it, that was very, very important that uh, we, uh, and if we had a very good sale week which we, or sale day which we did um, that week we we opened a free lunch to everybody in the staff restaurant um, to say thank you and they deserved to be sold thank you you know it made us millions or whatever and why not give them a free lunch which cost us I don't know what I can't remember what the price was now but um, that that was very important to, to make sure that they received thanks from senior management about 
the success that they've contributed towards the business. And we, we tried so hard to, to achieve that. Whether we did or not, is, um, the, your viewers will tell you, but <laughs> those of them were with us. But uh, yes, it was, it was, staffing's very important, very important. We had a great relationship with them um, as well, with everything. What was your personal relationship to many people of the staff? Uh, I, I, pri I, I, I took great pride in the fact that there was a period of time that I could probably walk around that store and know the first names of probably 50% of the people who worked there. Um, um, that was very important. I had an amazing secretary PA called Jillian. Um, Jill was incredible. And if there was anything that was that was on the grapevine but not quite reached our office, Jill would know of it. As you say, by the way, if you're passing Billy so and so in the menswear, uh, his mother's in hospital. She's she's not very well and. I don't think she's going to get through the week and you might just want to just drop a little. Said, Fine, thanks, Jill. And the next time I did a store walk about, you'd go, oh, Bill, yes, Miss Thomas, I'm so sorry to hear about you, Mum. You know, if you need any time off or anything, don't hesitate to ask or tell us. And, oh, and that would knock somebody out. Knock somebody out. But, but somebody in management knew that, knew that and was concerned for them. And, you know, it, it, it did concern it. I wanted to get to a position where we sent every member of staff a birthday card because we had the date of birth certainly on the acquisition, on the um, application forms. Uh, never got around to that, but that was what I wanted to do, just so, just so I'd get, get it signed by a senior management. We had a team of guys at senior management that would have totally loved doing that, not, not objected to doing it, you know, and put some sort of little remark on. Um, you know, try and do better next year, or <laughs> you know, whatever it was, depending on your personality. If you're a cynic, and uh, well done if you were somebody like me. Oh, just well done, oh, great, great. In fact, we we took one one day we had um, we took a million pounds in a day on the first day of our winter sale, and to celebrate that we had a, a glass uh, mug. I've got mine in my office. I'll show I'll show it to you. Um, uh, and we engraved on it to say thank you for your contribution uh, made to the waters of coin and take a million, a million pound day. And, um, you know, but so they, they took one home with them. And um, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was important to, to a lot of people. I've still got mine. I know that a couple of the directors have still got theirs, who I see, um, uh, have still got theirs. And it, was, it meant a lot to them think that uh, the company cared enough to appreciate that landmark. It was a landmark, God, you know, it was a million pound in a day. Um, and I, for the first time, almost saw, I think, 70, 75% of that was in paper money. And it, the other 50% was done uh, through a system called the Lampson system, where it was an air system. You put it in a tube, and it went up and went up to the, the counting house in the old, a lot of the stores had that in the old days. In fact, Grants of Croydon, when I first went there, had a little one on an overhead wire that you put in a, remember those? Put it, yeah, yeah. Off it went to somewhere. Um, well, we had them in the, and we had girls working in our tube room, it was called, because all these outlets came out, you know, plop, 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 plop. Girls sitting there with trays of money in front of them, giving the change, stamping the bills, making sure I got the right change and putting it in the letters, getting it back to people. And I actually couldn't, at the, uh, to see 75, well, it was probably, uh, it was probably maybe about 700,000 pound in paper money, you felt how the train robbers felt. You know, God, it took, it just, piles of it everywhere. And you think, you know, that wasn't a million. They got away with six million, didn't they? And you think, God, no, then, you know, there's poor little Mabel going, change, back it went, you know, and they put that in there. And it, 
there was this money everywhere in our tube room and um a lovely little uh, a lovely little lady ran our tube room and uh, we used to go in there and you all right can you manage yeah no everything's fine don't worry you're not fine you know we'll get some coffee in a minute have you had lunch no not had lunch here we'll get some lunch somehow let's get you help and you know it was but to see that amount of money i there it was piled up everywhere in we had plastic bags with it in and i thought christ what are we going to do with this i mean nowadays it, there's there's coinage and there's credit cards now credit cards are probably 15 20 percent of the, the total sorry 75 percent of the total business that is done in retailing but in those days credit cards were about 25 30 percent but to, so that yeah but so that was that was an eye opener like going down into the staff restaurant in the kitchens when we'd had a complaint from one of the girls that, that, that it was so hot in the kitchen what are we going to do about it and we went down and it was baking it was like an oven the minute you opened the door you could feel it they were in the kitchen and and we had to sort of realize we've got to put air conditioning in there get some proper ducting system in to extract the heat and you know rightly so but that well, that request would come it wouldn't be a demand it wouldn't be a we're all going on strike you know that that didn't exist in in our era it was that's always why i can't i get cross about the unions and the the railways and how they can't all get together and try and sort out these problems without the public suffering at the end of the day you know well, it's, it's crazy and you know sure enough within six weeks we fitted the aircon unit into properly into the ceiling we put a bit of stronger ducting in the extractors over the grills and i'm not saying i think 100 degrees probably went down to about 85 90. so it wasn't perfect i mean they still had every right to moan about it being 85 or 90 but at least we were seen to try to do what we could do and people were very happy if they knew that you tried even if you not actually you know succeeded but uh, so yeah but that was important fun days nowadays the union or the would step in and say it's got to be x degrees in the kitchen or there's going to be a walk out and you can't close your restaurant because the kitchen's too hot you know so uh, yes very good we never had any unions in in uh, in uh, orders of Croydon. never the, we our door is the union for retailers and uh, they tried to get in several times um, offering our staff this that and everything else but we'd already offered it to them um, in the first place they were all really working it and uh, people like Terry Vivi Ash would, would pick up the leaflets and you know this has come through from us still we need to perhaps look at this point and yes okay thanks for that and we do it and so we try to stay ahead of the pack but we never had union representation in any of our stores actually uh, we we're always very very aware that if you if you have to get the union in you've lost management is not doing its job properly my personal view sorry not always uphill by everybody <laughs> did you have any issue with the stuff visibly or theft or anything else yes Yes, we did. Yes, um, we had we had a, a good system whereby each uh, staff purchase had to be distributed at the end of their time of working with us um, on a daily basis. So, if somebody worked nine till one and left at one o'clock, we or we'd had a, a special area where Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Brown's, Mrs. Jones's purchase would be and it would be handed to them by one of our security team so we we relied on the fact that that there was nothing going out of the store that way it was as tight as could be possible um you do still find that that sometimes if somebody's bought one tie and one shirt and something else somebody might have slipped something else in the bag and it go out the front door but at the end of the day you're, you're at the mercy of the honesty of the individual staff um, as a matter of principle 
Um, the uh, the cash element was slightly different, um, and we inherited. Uh, uh, it, well, I don't think it'd even be allowed these days. We inherited a, a, a person who worked from head office. Uh, we had three. I had three, two plain clothes drawers that would catch the eye on shoplifters, um, and uh, we had a security team of about 13, 14 people in, in full security. And you know, we, we we never had any trouble with the troublemakers. We had to make sure a couple of our guys in security were boxers. So uh, if there was any problem, they would be dealt with. <laughs> what happened there, George? Uh, he fell down the stairs, Mr. Saunders, just on the way. To oh, did he? Yes, he did. He just fell down the stairs, did he? And the individual sitting there like that, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, we had to do that at times. Uh, but no, the, the staff, you really, you know, you really were at the, at the mercy of their honesty at the end of the day. But we had this person who would be told by the store director that, rumour has it that, that there's somebody pocketing cash out of the till on the men's tailoring department, no, men's shirt department, say. Whereby if the right money was given, you saw the shirt go over, the right money would be given, but it wouldn't make its way into the till. And that, that does happen. Um, nothing would, could, could go in a bag unless it had got the till receipt inside it. We, we tried to bring in that in to stop that. But the other thing was that um, the person who paid out the cash would always pay it out in the right money. And therefore, you could see if it was a shirt of £4.99 or £5.50, somehow there would be the correct money in front of that person as a great temptation if somebody's struggling and um, we did catch a couple of people on that system whereby it would come back to the office that this person took that money and that only that shirt was never recorded it was recorded at £4.49 instead of £4.99 so there was a 50p deficit and that's that's how we dealt with it in those days we didn't we didn't go public on that um, and it was not a popular way, and many a time that would not be a dismissible offence. We would just use it as a precautionary warning. But uh, to the, get the person in and said, this happened, you know what happened? Did you take the 50p? Well, yes, I did, I'm sorry. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. You know, well, you know, don't do it again, and you know, we'll put this on your file, but don't do it again. And if you, if you can't find 50p to get home, you must talk to your manager your manager will talk to personnel and will open a float for you upstairs that you can use until you're in a position to, to pay the debt off. So it was, yeah. So I think shoplifting is a very grave problem now, what I, what I now see on the, on the television. Huge problem. We had systems whereby the merchandise was tagged and you'd have to go through a, a, a removal of that tag at the point of sale. Um, we brought that in, we had a system whereby it wasn't flagged at point of sale, but it was picked up the minute you walked through the, the doors with the, the two islands would pick up something on the merchandise and the, 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 front, the noise would go off. Um, <coughs> but we used, it was always around about a half a percent of your total turnover. So if you can imagine orders acquiring 100 million, um, Ten percent, a million. It was a couple of hundred thousand, three, four hundred thousand. You could you could put it down. You were probably losing that a year uh, with the public. Um, um, pregnant ladies would have been the most commonest thing. Can't tell you the number of times I've been down in the office and there's this woman crying about being pulled over and. Eyes at it, and my security girl going, she's got a thing up her jumper, Mr. Saunders. Got a coat up there. Uh, go on, get your coat off, girl. Come on. And you'd have to be very careful, uh, but ask her to remove her coat, and sure enough, there'd be two blouses or whatever it was underneath, making out she was pregnant. We had one person who did it twice to us. Got caught the first time. 
and tried it again about a month later. But uh, yes, it's uh, it, it was it was very very difficult, very difficult. Um, but uh, the uh, the Saturday staff was always very difficult because they're always young people, and there were the latest thing that was happening when I left Croydon was that uh, there would be a school shopping list, meaning you needed a pair of Adidas in blue with the yellow stripe down them, the new ones please, and in a size nine, and you'd need da da da. And then one of the other members of the colleagues who were less honest would come in and try and steal those on a, on a Saturday when they were busy. It was always a Saturday, and you think, you know, even the and some of those came from some of Croydon's better schools, put it like that. Not just, uh, you know, not your demographics again. So it was, it's, it's a problem because it's dead money. You know, in the end, you've got to build your margin up. And if it's, that sort of stuff, the theft is coming out of the margins and reducing your profits. So if you're working for a company where profits are God, you've got to make that money up somehow than you normally do it by putting your price of your goods up. And that's why everything is so expensive everywhere. You know, it's a, it's a catch-22 situation. You can't always just put the lights off because the electricity bill's too high. Difficult, difficult problem, still not going away, still a problem 40 years down the line, I would think. So what was the um, atmosphere like, work, working conditions? Uh, we, we had a great atmosphere at the store, I thought. Um, you'd, you'd notice it when there was a foot of snow. And I lived in Upper Selston Road at that, at that stage, up at the top by, um, right at the top of that hill, by the golf club, by, by, by the golf course opposite. That's where we lived. And I think I left that morning at half past six in a suit and a pair of wellies to, to get to try and get to work. And I thought, well, it's going to take me an hour. Uh, it took me an hour and a half, two hours. I was totally exhausted. <laughs> and met at the front, met at the staff entrance by I'm trying to think of the girl's woman's name. One of our oldest serving members of staff. And she left home at half past five or half past uh, six o'clock, you know. Morning, Mrs. Saunders. Oh, morning, Gladys. Yeah, yeah, I left early, you know. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, have you got the coffee open? Up? Is it open? Up? Gladys, I don't know yet. I'll go and have a look. I'm sure somebody will be up in the staff canteen serving the coffees. And sure enough, old girl who would not moan about the temperature being 110 degrees in the under the fryer would be in there. Gerda Weeks, her name was, and a very, a very German, Gerda, Gerda Weeks, very nice lady, um, good worker, very hard worker, and she did all our catering for the staff. Sure enough, Gerda had somehow got you knew Gerda would be there somehow. Have you slept the night? You know, yeah, I slept in the oven over there. Oh, good, you kept warm then. No, you knew, you just knew Gerda would be in, because that was her doing her, doing breakfast and coffees, and you know she's got the little business going upstairs for the staff restaurant. So that there was a good atmosphere. We had a we had a uh, the staff had a free party every year, which they could come to without their partners, which I don't know was a now was a good thing or a bad thing, um, but. Um, <laughs> And it would be amazing that how you see other side of people. Oh. But the funniest thing we ever did was have a management part by request. We had a management party every year where I had 123 managers, and they would be invited to a party every year. Um, and they would be including the concession staff managers, and they wanted to do a fancy dress party. Well, if you've ever been to one. You know, if you've not been to one, you have to experience a fancy dress party. You know, the 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 head of personnel, who was what I would call the, the a very typical, very hard to please Scottish lassie, turned up as a bunny girl, which brought the house down. You know, ah, oh, have you seen Helen? Oh, she looks amazing. You know, 
wear that next Monday for your staff training meeting. You know, amazing. We had a we had a twenty stone uh, one of our managers who was very very, you know, do it this way, do it that, don't do it that way, just do it this way. He turned up uh, in just a huge bath towel with a big safety pin as a nappy. He did, yeah. And he walked in. I mean, uh, crazy. Absolutely. Our head of security, not a good one to say, our head of security turned up in a Gestapo uniform. Now, he got, he got, he had to go and change. Thank God for that. But that's our head of security, you know. Our head of the, 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 uh, um, uh, our, our clinical department came in a nurse's uniform much to the delight of all the men. Um, and uh, well, another guy came as Wee Willy Winky. Um, it was apps. it was, I mean, the, the fun is when everybody arrives, of course, but then you've got to sit in that blooming outfit all evening, haven't you? And you think, you, how difficult is that going to be? But it was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Um, and, and great fun. Well, we had, a, we had a great time at the manager's Christmas party. Always, always good fun, and never any noughties. No noughties went on, but it was good fun nonetheless. Uh, and we used to have a staff do once a year, normally held at one of the big establishments in Croydon, because we couldn't get them all in. We had f thirteen hundred of them entitled to attend. Uh, not all of them came. Not all Saturday people came, um, and uh, we used to hold that down at uh, one of the nightclubs in Croydon in those days. I mean, you know, it's still there. So yes, you know, there was good, th good, good fun. We didn't do sports days or anything like that because we, we were always busy trading, always busy opening, trading, making money for the company. But good fun. And eventually, you left. Why did you leave? I, d I left because I was, I was, uh, I'm 83 now. I was about 43 when I left, and I'd, I'd, I'd had the best time of it. I really had had the best time of it and enjoyed it. I'd also um, not been in the best of health, and Sheila um, kept on at me about, you know, why have you, got to, why have you got to go in Sunday? Well, we've got Sunday trading, and it's not fair to get all the staff to go in and, and you not be seen and show your face. You know, that's, that's not the way that you run a business, or. Thursday night, I would always get in at about nine o'clock, um, meaning I would leave just before we closed and just to make sure the staff knew that management were in there and all my team, my management team were the same. So they, we all sort of ended up with, um, we always used to say, the store is our mistress. You know, we never had time for anything else. So the, girl, the, the store was like, that's where you wanted to be. And we did love it very much indeed, oh, I certainly did. But I just felt I'd had enough. I wanted to do, so I, we bought a place in Spain, and um, I, I love, I went to live in that after I'd left orders. We, we lived there for six months, and in fact we only sold that place about 10 weeks ago when I realised that what I'd been diagnosed with as a precautionary measure. We thought we, we can't have that living over the other side, and not knowing what was going to happen to Europe and the market and God knows what. Um, and we'd got six children, we'd started having grandchildren, got 22 grandchildren now, and uh, eight grand, great-grandchildren, and we, we, you know, I was, I was always the one that was never there. Now, can you come to the sports day, Granddad? And I, I can't next week, John, I've got so-and-so to do. And so I'd, I'd had all my life doing that for about 45 years. I'm going to get not 45 years, yeah, probably 40 years. And I just thought that you know, I'd had enough. Retailing was changing. Uh, I didn't think for the better. Um, or Croydon was getting a bit tougher to sell in because that cake didn't get larger, but more people were having a slice out of it. All the shops down the Pearly Way had opened and, and were doing business and you know we had it we were finding it harder and harder to to sort of keep the pot boiling so uh, I decided to leave 
and I left and had a, uh, an opportunity to do something in America came up. Uh, I turned two or three uh, offers down in England, including, uh, I'm very proud to say, uh, an interview to be the MD of Harrods and to be the MD of um, uh, Selfridges. And I was able to turn them both down to say, no, thank you, my retailing days are finished now. I leave it to somebody younger with you know, the enthusiasm. And, but I was very proud that I was even considered to, to for those uh, jobs. And uh, one, one, one interview was with Al-Fayed himself, and the other interview was the then incumbent MD of uh, Selfridges who uh, asked me to go and see him before it went to the board. And I, so I was able to stop that. But I was very proud that somehow they still wanted me in department stores. But uh, I'd, I'd, I'd probably had enough. I ended up, we, had, we, we, we lived in Spain for a period of time, quite a period of time, about two, or th two years, three years. Um, we lived there on and off uh, for every, uh, about six months of the year, which we loved. Mm -hmm. That's where I caught skin cancer, so that was not the best choice I made. Um, and then uh, a friend came in and said he'd got involved with a, uh, a, a company in, in America, his father came in to say, my son is in, in the insurance business and he's made his company invest a lot of money in a startup company in America that is working on a methodology for treating uh, prostate cancer without any invasive surgery. He said, and, but he said he's, it needs some cash investment and his company don't know whether to invest any more money. So I said, how much do they need? He said, five million. I said, oh, God, that's a lot of money. He said, would you go over, if we paid your fare, would you go over in your time, work, f look at it, look at it through the books, and look at it generally, and see whether or not you think we should invest this money? So I said, yes, I'd, I'd love to. I knew, knew this person, MD of a big company in Croydon, which I better remain nameless. His son was a senior person in the insurance business. Anyway, I went over to Atlanta, in Georgia to look at these, look at this business, and it was, there was about hundred, well, there was about sixty people working in it, and it had got to the point where they needed approval to sell it from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, um, and they didn't know whether to spend the millions in it to get it approved, or whether to back away and just accept that it's a nice little company to keep invested, and that the share prices will vary a little bit. Anyway, I said I, I would do it if I were you, mm -hmm. and um, we, they did it. Um, it was it's called a system called brachytherapy, where they inject irradiated seeds directly into a tumour, and it burns the tumour away from the inside by penetration only of a needle. You don't have any stomach cut out or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> uh, though we went with it, and it became very successful, and I made quite a bit of money out of it. I, I, I did, did, did it all for nothing to start with. Then they said, well, would you come on the board if we gave you shares? So I said yes. So they put me on the board and I had to go over there once every six months, um, and once every three months for board meetings. And um, delighted to say it was very successful. We had an 82% success rate in curing prostate cancer. 82%, so if you went in with prostate cancer, 82% rate we would get it cured for you. And um, in the end I got prostate cancer. So I went to my own company to be cured in America. And they cured me of prostate cancer 30 years ago. True story, isn't that amazing? That's a true story, yeah. yeah. I've not got prostate cancer now, I've got lymphoma, which is a blood disease problem but um, that was uh, yeah and we've now cured oh, we've, we've, I think we've cured half a million men of prostate cancer something like that yeah, and still go. and we're trying to but we left it uh, the company was we were bought over a hostile bid came in for us and the share price was such that it was beneficial for us to sell it um, sell the company and um, uh, we were about to 
get approval for breast cancer. So instead of the poor ladies having to have mastectomies, um, you could inject through the, 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 the breast these little seeds and burn the tumour away and then withdraw the seeds to remove what's left of the tumour. And it was done as an outpatient procedure. Um, and we couldn't get it approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And in the end, a Canadian company bought us, not an American company. And Canada and America in business are like that. I expect you know that. They hate each other. Oh, America and Canada. Oh, fight the century. And um, a Canadian company bought us um, and uh, took it all forward and got the approval in Canada and then passed it now on to that in America. So it's in America, it's not always necessary to have to have mastectomies. You can just do it with these needles going in. Yeah. So very exciting. We're coming to the end. Yes, um, thank you. Would, would we, uh, maybe an outlook, you know, what would you think about your uh, 10 years work there? What would you see oh. in the future? What, what, yeah, what I can would be the message you know, I can, for today? I, I can tell you, happiest 10 years of my life working, without mm -hmm. any doubt. Happiest 10 years. So lovely to see uh, the people responding, the business flourishing. You know, we flourished. We really did flourish. We we were trendsetters in everything in that in that era, and it was, it was the happiest ten years of my working life. Um, I had great times in other stores. The, the, Cam the Croydon, the uh, Portsmouth store was great, and the Camby store was great. But my my love was certainly Alders of Croydon, and I I could cry. Now I go past and look at it now with the windows all papered over and it was a great building and it had been there for, well, I was there to celebrate the 125 years of, of the establishment of the building and we did a big you know, 125 years mm -hmm. anniversary. We had that, we actually, well we didn't, but the, the, the town clerk arranged for the Queen to visit. Um, not just to see orders of Croydon, I hasten to add. She did uh, something to open some gardens in Croydon, but he persuaded her, or the concert, the, 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 the group, to stop outside the front of orders for photo shoots. And we gave her um, a little gift for her uh, new grandson, which must have been, gosh, who would that have been? That's 30 years ago. Would that have been, uh, I can't remember now. I can't remember. Anyway, yes, and uh, but that was my happiest time, without doubt. It was great to see great people, wonderful people to work with, wonderful people, and yeah. uh, a great time in all in Croydon. You, you talked a lot about the management, about the relationship to the staff, and, yeah. and the other way around, you know, yeah. well, the staff to the management as well. Yeah. What would you wish for the future? Do you think it's completely different today, or I think management should appreciate staff more. I really do. I don't think there's, there's, I think in staff, the, since everything has now become a matter of a, the accountants running businesses, which is very sad. It's very hard for a real merchant to say, don't underestimate the value of the, of the selling staff. Please don't do that. You know, they are important. And the easiest thing to look at is saying you've got eight people in the electrical department. Why do you need eight? Well, because you're busy. Yes, but what if you had seven? And then you've got to sit and fight an, uh, 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 a, a figures man about the justification of one person in electrical or something like that. And it was getting a bit like that. It was getting a bit sort of, how can we cut corners? How can we save money? How can we improve our margins? and make more profit and yes that's so critical and now you look at orders and you know it closed I don't know what went wrong there to for it to close so quickly I really don't um, I've never found out but all of a sudden what a, you know it's you think well that was a very profitable business running it turning over nearly a hundred million pound turnover with a profit margin of say 11 percent it was, it was 11 million profit what happened to that and it probably, some of that m profit would have been used to generate 
the salvation of some of the other companies in that business uh, and perhaps other stores closed because they just were given money from our generation of profit but we you know it was I don't know it's, uh, it's, it's that sort of thing I think it's I do think I do think management's uh, management role is a very important role, which is often diminished. The one person I think who is an unbelievably good manager is my friend Peter Harrison, who owns Furniture Village, and I think the quality of the staff in Furniture Village are absolutely exceptional, and that's him because he is a his background is exactly the same as mine. We both we used to sit our corners arguing to save our staff costs at, at, at meetings at uh, Hanson Trust because they just wanted to sort of cut 10 out of that section and you'll save X amount of money. No, it's not like that, you know. Why do you need a workroom of four girls turning up hems of dresses? Because we're selling dresses at £100 a dress, not £10. So if somebody paying that sort of money, would expect somebody to come down with a little pin cushion and Yes, we can take a half an inch off that with any trouble, madam. Be ready for you tomorrow. And, you know, that's why we've got a good business. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the relationship between management and staff is very critical. And I think it's sadly lacking these days. Sadly lacking. So, what do you think the lessons from working at Albers are for today's working life? Uh, but for for me, or generally, no, generally. Uh, I I, th I think that I think retailing is a great uh, a great place to be pursuing a career. Um, uh, it sort of worries me a bit that that the progressionary uh, line of of management promotion is such that it's it's a bit more limited these days than it than it's ever been. Um, and you know the girl or boy who was not studying from university when they joined Alders of Croydon learnt a whole different aspect of knowledge when they joined us as to the, 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 the value of mar marketing goods and um, they uh, that, that, that I just think is lacking these days I just don't think there's any we used to say, what price is a Christmas tree on Boxing Day? You know, but it's, it's, it's only very bright to answer that question, do you? But you know, you still can't, I walk around stores at Christmas, so I'll tell you, Sheila, they'll be half price tomorrow, that'll be cleared tomorrow, they'll go out at a pound of pop. And you can actually see the stuff that you know isn't going to smell long before Christmas, and say if they took 20% off it now, they'd sell it, well, you know, in, in, they'll run, but in Three days' time, it will be half price, you know, fifty percent off or or seventy-five percent off. Um, and there's not that awareness. And you think you walk around some of those shops these days, and no, I think the individual retailers probably have the the um, the betterment or the 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 uh, more knowledge of their business because it's their own personal money that's involved. I think, you know, the, 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 I can just say about Bansted High Street, some, some great shops in Bansted High Street that are still privately owned, and they're still, you know, they do a good business. They do a good business. Um, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think people, I had to go to uh, a retail college when I was at Harrods, that was part of my training. I had to get my National Retail Distribution Certificate, NRDC, I'll never forget it. And I had to do that in my time after work, and um, that was one of the things we did with at Orders of Croydon for our, our people. But we used to make them go to college at least one day a month. Well, I had to do it one day a week when I was at Harrods. And that day, that, that, that week, I would not, I'd walk out of that college about 9.30 at night. I'd get a Green Line bus, a High Park corner, to get me back to Cambly, where my, I was living with mum and dad at the time and um, it would take an hour and a half, I get in at half past 10. And my dad would say, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing that for? Well, I'm getting trained, I'm getting a training at Harrods, which, which you couldn't put a price on. Used to watch movies of how to, old movies of how you sold to a customer, 
how you approach the customer. Good morning, madam. You know, what a nice day or whatever. And uh, uh, important. I'm going on. I'm rabbiting now. You've got to no, stop no. me. Got one more question for you. The are still big. What would you like to happen to it? Oh, I think oh, it's listed. I think, isn't it? I what think would, it's a, what it's would you got. Like for it to oh God, God knows. What a good question. I don't know. I mean, part of it goes back to the original drawing I showed you in the office, Rolf. That uh, you know that used to be a main cut through. And it's actually a public thoroughfare that mm -hmm. where we put the mall. I mean, part above that, the Joshua Alders coffee shop used to be his own breakfast room, apparently, on the first floor by the fashion department. So, I mean, all of that is listed, so heaven knows what they're going to do. I think if it's a grade one, you can't change it without getting approval from the council. And, you know, it, it's, 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 it's 125 years old. And you think, what can that be used for? You, you probably couldn't put a lot of weight on it. It's sort of on the first floor, and we, we had lots of problems making sure that, you know, if we did any shop fitting, it was. I don't know. I mean, uh, grants have turned theirs into some sort of leisure complex, which I suppose might be the only solution you could do if you could put it there. Well, we haven't got an ice skating rink in Croydon. You could put that on the ground floor of. Of, of orders with um, access from the Rickliffe Centre. Um, I've seen that done in the States where they have uh, ice skating rinks in the middle of department stores or in the middle of shopping centres. Um, I don't know what I just don't know what else you do. It, w it will never reopen again as a store. Um, so, you know, it, it, would, it, would it be the flat conversion that everybody talks about as being ideal? Well, we've got no. Well, we've got a basement access through the Whitgift Centre, but there's no basement area that we were trading in, to my knowledge, um, that you could use for parking and get access to a, a main thoroughfare to get your car in and out if you were a resident in a flat there. Um, but, but, you know, it might be that they convert it into, into um, a, a, a living. But it's a good question. I wish I knew the answer to it. I mean, the, the, that, that really figures with the whole of the thing about Croydon, doesn't it? When you, when you get back to the structure of Croydon and what is it going to do and how is it going to do it? And I think we've got to sort of get a few lets done in the Whitgift Centre first. Well, I gather, I hear there's about one in three now that are vacant. And you think, well, that's not, you know, you've got to be careful calling it a shopping centre, you know short-term let vacating is not really the grounded grounded foundation for a, a good trading business so uh, uh, I don't know I don't know wish I knew thank you very very much oh don't fascinating insight thank you wonderful